Hey guys, hey, uh, thank you guys for being here and braving the, the cold and the wind. You guys just have one more week of this, right? Yeah. Just one more week and then you guys are meeting indoors, so looking forward to that. Well, everyone, my name is Scott and uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Rocky Peak and I was just really, yeah, I was really encouraged when Kelly asked me to come and share. This is my first time and so, yeah, I mean, uh, Kelly and I, we just really uh, gotten close over the past nine months that I've been here. He's taken me to some cool coffee places and got to really know him and Michelle and his baby Deacon. And so you guys, you should be encouraged, uh, you know, having a leader that loves the Lord and loves you guys. So, so thankful for that. Well, we are continuing our series on relationology. What a cool name that is. And I hope I don't contradict everything that Kelly and Michelle said last week in their Q&R. But I wanted to do something a little bit different uh, tonight than I normally do and, um, you know, basically just kind of share from my heart of uh, just the relation, it, topic on relationship. But just to give you a background on myself because this is my first time here, uh, I wanted to give you a picture of my family here. Here's a, do you guys like my Photoshop skills? That's my average. I like Harry right there in the background. Where's Megan? Actually, this is my real family here. Uh, there's my wife, Christina, who I've been married to for 17 years. And my son, Nathan, who is in high school in Revolution Group. And we just got a puppy. Her name is Mimi. We just got her during the whole pandemic. Uh, who, how many of you guys have puppies here? Several of you guys? OK, yeah. So well, she's about six months old. She, we're so happy because she just stopped eating her own poop. Um, it's kind of gross when she eats her own poop and then tries to kiss me after that, but not a good mixture, but I'm glad that those days are over. But anyways, when I was in my 20s, I didn't really hear many teachings on dating and relationships and marriage, things like that. It was almost like, you guys got to try to figure it out on your own. So I'm really encouraged that we are talking about these kinds of things because, because we didn't talk about it really led to us making a lot of poor decisions and, and just being in toxic relationships. And, and so I know that we, l we learn and grow from our personal experiences, but when you can learn from other people's mistakes and personal experiences, that's even better. So I'm really encouraged that we are having this series right now. But maybe you're at a place right now, you're like, man, I don't even know where to start, you know? I don't even know where to start. Maybe you're wondering, how do I meet someone, that special someone? Maybe some of you guys just came out of a relationship and you're just like, you're feeling burned, you're feeling discouraged, you're like, I've had it, I'm done with it. Maybe you're currently in a relationship. Some of you guys, it's going very well. Some of you are thinking, is this the right person for me? Am I the right person for them? Or maybe some of you are like, man, I just love the single life. I love being a bachelor and bachelorette, and that's okay too. But for some of you who are looking for that special someone, like I realize there are various places to look for that special someone. I've had some conversations with people in our life group. We're in a married couples group, and we're just going around and sharing how we first met each other. One person said, you know, I was uh, working at a cell phone store and this customer came in and then she, she was so pretty and I asked for a number. Another couple said, I was working at a restaurant, I was a waitress and a group of guys came in. I was like, oh, that's cool. And, and he asked for the number. Another couple were in school together. Uh, he was a football star. She was, she was part of that school and, and they kind of met each other through that. So there's just different ways that people meet one another. I mean, it's nothing novel, right? A lot of people nowadays, how do they meet? They meet through online as well too, right? Uh, leveraging technology. And actually a lot of people I heard nowadays are meeting online. Actually several of my friends have. I thought it would be interesting. So I did a Google search on the top dating sites and apps right now. So I want to just kind of share some of them with you. Okay, you probably heard of Match.com. That's probably one of the most popular dating app sites. And this is what they said. They say this is your best bet, okay? This is how they describe themselves. The OG reign supreme with a tried and true algorithm and features that modernize with the user base. Okay, that sounds pretty interesting. Okay, so there's another 
place called OK Cupid. And they say this is best for liberals and leftists. <laughs> I don't know why. Have you guys heard of OK Cupid? Uh, this is what they say. People who follow current events will enjoy OK Cupid's Tumblr-esque design and a focus on social issues. Is Tumblr still around? Okay, I didn't know that. All right, so they say this one is best for those looking to get married. So for the serious ones. This is eHarmony. They've been around forever too. And this is how they promote themselves. Casual daters will feel smothered, but eHarmony has made serious changes to appeal to marriage-minded millennials. All right? So those are for serious. I have two more. So this is uh, best for people nervous about meeting IRL. What is that? In real life. I had to look that up. I didn't know that acronym. <laughs> so lame. So this is coffee meets bagel. I had a couple friends uh, that went on this. And they said, skip the pressure of constant inbox notification with CMB's u small user base and authentic curated matches. All right. So this is the last one. Best. This is kind of funny. Best for outgoing women and shy guys. So if you're an alpha female and you're an introverted guy, this might be for you. It's called Bumble. And they say women are required to make the first move. So it's great for ladies tired of being bombarded by creepy dudes. Interesting. All right, just to be clear, I'm not endorsing any of these dating sites or apps. That's not what we're here for tonight. Nor am I saying that you can't meet someone through these tools. But when I look at the scriptures, when I look at uh, just some of my personal experiences, uh, having counseled, dating, engaged, married couples, I find that there are certain places that they have looked where their relationships have lasted and endured, where it wasn't just them falling in love, but they stayed in love. And so those are... Those are the places that I wanted to just share tonight, the five places. And some of these are familiar to you guys, and some of them may, may not be. But the first place that we look when we're looking for someone is to look back. And I love this words from Psalms 139, 13, 14. It says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Before we look out for that, finding that special someone, we have to look back at where we came from or really who we came from. Our creator God, who's the one who created us. Not just the out, outer part, but the in, inward part of our body. That he is this master craftsman. That we're wonderfully complex. I mean, think about how complex our human body is with all of our system, nervous system, circulatory system, skeleton system. We're so complex. And how we're like an open book that, that he saw us from the very beginning, from conception to birth. All the stages of our life, every day of our life, before we even live one day, before we even born. I mean, that's mind-boggling, right? But understanding and living out that truth is going to radically change our, our perspective on things and show us that we're not an accident here, that he's been faithful, that he began a good work in us, and he will be faithful to continue being faithful in our lives. So we don't have to operate. We don't have to live from a place of fear or insecurity, but from a place of trust and hope and faith in Jesus who's the author of our lives, the author of our story, and he's the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. I know that when we look back, just even in our, in our own lives, you know, uh, the 20, 25 years that you guys, or 18 to 25 years that you've lived here on earth, when you, when you just look back on our own life, there's some maybe, for some of you, there's some painful memories that get unearthed. Maybe you felt abandoned by your parents. Maybe you've had struggles with one of your parents. Maybe you didn't even live with your parents at all. Or maybe you even felt like you were abused by some loved one. Or maybe you've made some failures and mistakes and you've just lived with a lot of guilt and shame and condemnation. But your Heavenly Father 
would say, I'm your be- you are my beloved. That you are my masterpiece. You are my child. You are my son and daughter. You are my chosen one. And so our identity, our worth, our, our, our significance doesn't come in a person. It comes from Christ in us. And I think that's the danger. A lot of times we want that person to fill that void, that emptiness that can only be filled by our Heavenly Father. Our identity is in Christ, not in a person, not in your physical appearance, not in your wealth, your career, none of those things. Your identity, like I said, is in you being his child, your, his precious son and daughter. That's the first place we have to look, to look back at his faithfulness. The second place we look is to look in, look in. And this is what it says in Proverbs 4.23. It says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. I know that's a very popular passage. But let's be honest. Most of us care a lot about how we look on the outside. Just being honest, right? That's why when we look at a group photo and we're in it, who's the first person that we look at? It's probably yourself, right? Oh, man, what's wrong with my skin? What's wrong with my hair? I gained a few pounds. I don't know. And let's be honest, we care a lot about how other people look on the outside as well. Our, the beauty, uh, the entertainment, media, clothing industry, they all depend on our fascination and our gravitation toward physical beauty, what's on the external. All of those things, it depends, you know, their livelihood depends on that And we, you know, but the scriptures tell a different story. It tells you to focus on something else. It tells you to focus on what's within because that's where life flows out of. And that's what determines the course and the pathway of our lives. But our cultures, we're just obsessed with physical appearance. We spend so much money, time, energy, resources beautifying ourselves and looking good on the outside while within, inward, we're rotting away. And you know what? For some time, we can get away with that, looking polished and looking fine and looking, you know, beautifying ourselves on the outward and, and ignore what's on the inside. But eventually, what's rotting and wasting away is going to come out and percolate out. Just a sidebar, sidebar here, but when we have sex out of marriage, we're not just giving a part of our body to another person. We're giving a part of our heart, a part of our soul to that other person. The gift that God has given, that soul, that inward heart, we're giving it away. We're not guarding it. And that's why when we break up with someone, what do we say? We're heartbroken. We're broken and we're brokenhearted. It's not body broken, it's heartbroken. So what do we do? Like how do we care for our souls and our hearts? We gotta pay attention to it. We have to be vigilant about it. We have to we have to be doing some soul searching. And I'm not talking about just that worldly term of soul searching, but kind of a heart examination. You know, a lot of times we go, we ask people when we see someone, hey, what's, how, how's life? How, how's it going these days? But we need to ask ourselves, like, how is my soul, how is my heart these days? And I love that verse in Psalms where it says, search me, O God. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive, see if there's any wicked, wickedness in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You got, we got to ask that because our heart's deceitful. Our hearts can just drift. Our hearts can get hardened. I know my heart gets hardened toward God, and I've been a Christian for a very long time. 
But it's so easy for my heart to just drift and heart to just wander off. We also need to do some soul cleaning. I, I call it soul cleaning. I love that, you know, those words that David prayed. He was a man after God's own heart, but he had such a downfall. In Psalms 51, he cries out to God, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. You know, like when, when you have heart issues, I mean, just even a physical heart, there's a clog in the valve, and that causes a heart attack, right? And you need to flesh that out. In the spiritual sins, there needs to be a cleansing that needs to happen in our hearts, in our souls. And we need to also feed our souls through his word, through being in community with one another, hungering and thirsting for his righteousness. We need to look in, look within. The third place to look is to look around. Look around. There's a twofold meaning to this. The first is like, do you have trusted friends that will speak the brutal truth to your life? And I know Kelly had mentioned this last week as well too. But it's like when we're driving, we, s- we have blind spots. Do we have people in our lives who will share what we don't see ourselves? Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own, s- is in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. I think Kelly mentioned this uh, proverb last week as well, too, that wounds from a friend are better than kisses from an enemy. Or wounds from a friend are truthful, but kisses from a, an enemy multiplies. You know, in my early 20s, I was in a relationship for about three to four years with, uh, with this girl, and it was just a toxic, it was not a good relationship. We were immature, we were hurtful to one another, and some of my close, friends had come to me and told me the truth, told me the brutal truth, and and they saw warning signs, they saw red flags. And you know what I did? I pushed them away. I was angry. I was like, man, you don't know me. You don't know her. I was like, you you don't care about me. And I just kind of distanced myself from them. I was a fool. I was a fool. Only later did I realize that they were correct, and I heeded their advice, and we went our separate ways, and that was the wise thing to do. And I was so thankful, actually, for those friends who I'm friends with to this day for the past 20-something years because they were courageous enough to speak truth into my life even when I rejected them, even when I... I made them, you know, tearful, and I just abandoned them. They were willing to risk all of that to be able to speak truth into my life. The second thing, the second thought I have when we look around is that when we're in a faith community, worshiping, serving together, encouraging each other, praying together, Man, that is something special. This is a gift that we have right here, even though it's really cold right now. <laughs> I wish we could bundle up. But this is what it says in Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. In other words, the person that you may meet and that you may marry could be right here in this room. It got kind of awkward right there. Then. <laughs> Not for Reed. Reed is hooked up already. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else engaged here? All right, yeah. Anyone else? Oh, so you guys are the only ones. Oh, no. All right, everyone else is like quiet. It's like a pin drop. Ding. But I think, I think a lot of times we have these like, romantic ideas of grandeur like we're gonna f- we're gonna f- you know meet that perfect guy perfect girl on this european cruise and we're gonna fall madly in love with each other 
or that we're going to see someone across the room in a lecture hall. I don't know why I'm looking at you. <laughs> I'm going to look at you. We, we lock eyes with each other, and then everything else fades away in the background, and then we start soaring up into the sky, rolling around, moving around with music of La La Land in the background. Maybe I've been watching too many romantic movies. I don't even like romantic movies. But you know what I'm talking about, right? We have these romantic ideas, and there's nothing bad about that, but just to give you a reality check, that's not usually how it happens. I'm not saying that can't happen. Maybe in Mally and Reed's case, <laughs> the romantic guy that he is. But it doesn't always happen that way. In, in my case with my wife, we were in small group together. We were serving together. We were, um, we were, it was a budding friendship that led to dating and then to marriage. I know that every uh, pathway, is, there's no set pathway. Every pathway is different. But I really believe in the context of being together, encouraging one another, being in a local church, serving together, God can bring people together into a romantic relationship as well. I'm going to leave it at that. Look around. All right, we're going to move on. Look ahead. This is the fourth place to look. Look ahead. And I love these words from Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.14. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. You know, what does it look like to begin with the end in mind? To begin with the end in mind. It means not being short-sighted. It means not chasing after the physical things that fade away. And don't get me wrong, we can be physically attracted to each other. Actually, we should be physically attracted to each other. I was attracted to my wife. She was one fine, sassy, cute girl, and she still is. She, you know, we're having a conversation. She was like, Scott, I think I was just attracted to your personality. I'm like, yeah, right. You knew you had the hots for me. In my prime, I was one hot, handsome guy. Well, she's, thanks, Reed. <laughs> but the reality is, guys and ladies, we will grow old. I'm in my mid-40s now. I may not look a day over 43, but I'm in my mid-40s. We will grow old. Our skins will wrinkle. Our ha hairs may grow bald. Our hairs may grow gray. Our externals will eventually fade away. But what will remain is our mutual passion to run this race, to win the prize, the heavenly prize for which Christ has called us heavenward. What will remain for my wife Christina and I is our mutual devotion, commitment, submission to one another. Those are the things that will remain. You know, um, I met this one couple named Chris and Erica on a short-term mission trip I went to a couple years ago to India. And uh, this couple was so cute. They were married for about 40 years, and maybe even longer than that. And they would address each other as like, my darling, my treasure, my delight. And I was like, wow, after 40 years? <laughs> She would, he would open the door for her, and he, he, they would just say such loving, affectionate things to one another. And I was like, Chris, Erica, what's the secret? What's the secret sauce of your enduring, persevering marriage? You know? I don't do that with my wife, just, just telling you. I'm just like, oh! <laughs> you know, she'll just be like, hey! Hey, hey, come here. We should be more affectionate and loving. That's a different story. We love each other so much. <laughs> I love you, Christina, if you're watching this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was like, what's the secret of not just falling in love? Because falling in love, you know, oh, I fall in love with you. That's easy. But what's the secret of staying in love for 40 plus years? And he says, Scott, like when we made that commitment to the Lord and to, to each other on that 
wedding day, it was a, it was a lifelong commitment. It was, actually, it was an eternal commitment. <laughs> and they said, you know, that's why we choose to cherish each other every day. And I remember thinking, gosh, I'm going to cherish my wife. When we look, we have to look ahead at what is eternal, what is forever, what is everlasting, not at what is temporary, the physical things that will fade away. The last thing is, last place we look is look up. And this is what it says in Exodus 13, 21, 22. And we, we sang about those lyrics, from those lyrics. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And you know, this is referring to the Israelites as they escaped Egypt and they were wandering in the desert, in the wilderness, and God gave them these visible signs, this movement of the cloud and fire. And I believe that we are to look up and see his hand, his movement in our lives in times of prayer, in times of worship, in times of reading his word. These are his signposts that he gives to us that we, don't, that we won't be looking down you know, some of us are just like, I'm hopeless. I'm just, I'm no good. I'm just a loser. I don't know, just, I, I, have, I don't have anyone, you know, just discouraged. And we just have our heads down. And, and God wants to lift our heads. He's, he says he's a lifter of our heads. Look up. Look up. Actually, guys, just look up right now for a moment. I know you can't see all the stars, but if you just look up, Look at the moon. Look at some of the stars. Just think about that. Our Heavenly Father, and he breathed the stars, the galaxies, the sun, the moons, this vast cosmos and universe into existence. Think about that. He is the creator, the maker of the universe and the earth. I love that song. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you, maker of heaven and earth, creator of all the earth. Will he not lead you? Will he not provide for you? Will he not carry you and shepherd you? The one who breathed life into existence. The one who breathed life into you. Will he not? sustain you he's not gonna he's not sleeping he's not slumbering he's not slow in keeping his promises so when he says go we go and when he says wait we wait you know for you know what i realize is that waiting time is not wasted time it can be the most rich rewarding defining time of your life with the lord and i can say that with conviction because I experienced it. And after my breakup, I remember making that commitment and dedication to the Lord, and I said, God, and I gave myself a time frame. I said, for one year, I'm not going to be in any relationship. I'm not going to think about any of those things. I'm just going to fix my eyes on you. I'm going to be devoted to you. You are going to be my first love. You will always be my first love. I'm not going to just give everything to you. I'm going to look up to you. And I just said, I waited, and I waited. And I tell you, I mean, honest truth, it was exactly almost a year later from September 2001 to September 2002 that I met my wife, or met, you know, not met my wife, but we began that relationship. And I'm so thankful for that time, that waiting time, where God just infused so much of, him into my life. That's where I actually received my calling into ministry during that season as well, too. I'm so grateful for that. And I want to encourage you. Perhaps God is calling you to just wait 
if you look at the scriptures, right, the people that God used so mightily, Moses, Joseph, Abraham, David, all these people had to wait on the Lord for his timing, for his leading. And I just want to encourage you, look up and see the leading in his life. Look up to the cross. Look up to the cross, the one Savior who has given everything of himself to you, who has redeemed you. And that's why we can sing out that he's turned our graves into gardens, our, our shame into glory, our mourning into dancing, ashes into beauty. That we can praise him because of that. That we can say, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. We can look up and see our maker. We can look up and see our savior. Look up. Look up. And I believe God is calling some of you in a you know, maybe even to the mission fields. I don't know. You may not even be in this country. <laughs> you may meet someone out of this nation. Look up. And if there's anything, I'm closing up, but if there's anything that you can take away from tonight, it's that when you're looking, and even when you're not looking, look to Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will sustain you. And look with Jesus. See what Jesus sees in you. He's made you. He loves you. And he will lead you every season, every chapter of your life. Guys, ladies, this is just the beginning of your story. Just walk with him step by step. And I promise you, he will lead you. Let me pray for us right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight and this word of encouragement you give to each person here. Lord, you call us your beloved, your sons and daughter, and that we can look back and see your faithfulness, that you began a good work and you will be faithful to complete what you started. That we can look in and guard and fiercely protect the soul that you have given to us. That we can look around and see that there are trusted friends that will speak truth. And we can look around and see the community of faith that we are worshiping and serving together with. that we can look ahead at what is eternal and everlasting. And then we can look up and know that you are our maker, our savior, who will lead us every step of the way. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for being our good shepherd. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.